Hi, welcome to the Real Estate Roundtable, where we discuss all topics real estate. I'm Nick Aarons. Hey, and I'm Steve Crowley. I'm Darren Shepard. And I'm Jimmy Reed, and we're your hosts. Welcome, everybody. Today, we've got Anthony Alosi here, and we're going to be discussing 1031 exchanges. So, Anthony, you're a 1031 exchange accommodator. That's here correct. In Orange County, right? Yes. So... Brief overview, what is a 1031 exchange and why would somebody choose to do a 1031 exchange? Sure. So an exchange basically is a product for a real estate investor. So I always tell people right off the bat, we need to make sure we're dealing with uh, uh, people that own investment real estate. It's not something for your mm -hmm. personal residence, right? Your primary residence has an exclusion for capital gains tax. The 1031 is geared for investors, owners of investment real estate to defer the payment of capital gains tax on the sale of their investment property. Got it. So if they were to sell a condo for $500,000 and trade it up and buy a property worth a million, they can basically move appreciated equity of that property over to the other one and not get taxed on that appreciation. That, that's right. Yeah, really the, they're, what they're moving over, Nick, is the gain that they've had and any tax due uh, on the on the gain or the appreciation of the property. So that's exactly right. They take their existing investment property, they buy something equal or greater mm -hmm. in value, equal or greater in equity to what they've sold. And now they have six, as long as they conform to the timeframes of an exchange, they've successfully deferred the payment of capital gains tax. And this is Got something it. actually, it's perfect timing. We're talking, we literally like a two, week and a half, two weeks ago, have passed our hundred year anniversary uh, in the tax code. 1031's been around since late um, November of, of 1921. So we've, oh, wow. got, we've got over 100 years of history now in the books for 1031 transactions. Got it. So this is not something new that investors are doing. Definitely not. Yeah, it's been around <laughs> a long time. And, yeah. and the current format or structure that we see, we call it a delayed exchange or a forward exchange or a 1031 exchange. Some people still call it a starker exchange, but the format that we know where you sell first and buy thereafter, that's been around again a long time since the late 80s, early 90s is when they finalized the rights for 1031. Got it. Okay. So, curious with the 1031, I know there's some timing restrictions on it. What does that look like? Yeah. So, okay. the basic structure of an exchange is the, the total life of the transaction is 180 calendar days from start to finish. The start uh, occurs when the escrow of the property that you're disposing of, the relinquished property, or some people call it the down leg. When that down leg closes, that starts the time clock. So you got 180 calendar days from that point forward to acquire any and all replacement properties that you're gonna do to satisfy your exchange. That's you know the, the, the easier of the two dates, let's say. The tougher part is the of the 180 days, the first 45 days is the identification period. And within that 45 day window, you must identify any and all replacement properties you plan on buying as part of your 1031. After day 45, you're you're not able to identify any additional property so really you're kind of limited and bound by both of those two deadlines got it so if somebody were to sell a piece of real estate here in san clemente and they wanted to do a 1031 exchange up towards let's just say mission viejo they would have to identify that property within that 45 day span going into escrow on the san clemente property yeah actually 45 days after the san clemente property closed escrow Got it. After it closed yeah. escrow. Yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah. more specifically, just for kind of a practical matter. I mean, yeah, they can ideally, they, they should start looking for their Mission Viejo property once they get their San Clemente property in escrow. Because they can be under contract and in escrow on both properties at the same time. Absolutely. And well, okay. they should, especially today with the way we see properties <laughs> flying off the shelf. Yeah. 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 So. So I'm curious, I know one of the things kind of we chatted about real briefly is you've seen a big uptick in 1031 exchanges. So tons of investors are trading up, even though the market is appreciating at a very rapid rate right now. Is that what I'm hearing? Most definitely. And, you know, again, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of good news, bad news for an investor. Right? The good news is they just made kind of top dollar on their investment that they may have bought in four, five, eight, ten years ago. You know, the challenge for them is now they've got to go into the marketplace and find Presumably something that's at, you know, at its peak as well, too. So, you know, their investors are constantly looking to try to, you know, always better their investment. I mean, that's the vehicle mm -hmm. or, or the strategy for them is look at their portfolio every whatever, three to five years, five to seven years, find out which investments aren't performing up to their standard 
and you know turning those over and getting something better. We also see investors getting out of one property type and into another one that might uh, yield them a better cash flow. So for 1031 purposes, you've got some flexibility with property type. Um, people are familiar with the like kind requirement, but the like kind requirement really says sell something held for investment, buy something held for investment. So less about the property type, more about the property use. And the use has to be, again, held for investment. So you yeah. can exchange a condo for a single family, a single family for a townhouse. You can buy it into an apartment. You can get into commercial property. Um, whatever makes sense for you as an investor, you're able to move in and out of different property types for 1031. Got it. So it sounds like it's a pretty loose um, definition of like kind, as long as it's real estate generally for investment purposes. Sounds like yeah. it should work. I mean, I wouldn't use the word loose, but yeah, I would say it's yeah. just broad. Yeah, because there's yeah. Really nothing loose about 1031. <laughs> it's very, yeah. very specific to a lot, to a lot of things. But yes, the like kind requirement has has you know kind of become much more broad now uh, since the finalization of the regs. Prior to that, it was very property specific. Like for like meant. Uh, commercial for commercial, industrial for industrial, single family mm -hmm. for single family, so on and so forth. Now it's been, you know, much more, like I said, much more open to, so investors are definitely able to move in and out of different property types to their needs. So I'm curious and I, and I have to ask, I'm sure you've seen some just go totally sideways because somebody's not thinking right or just something wonky happened. What are the best ways to kind of prep and avoid some of those common mistakes? And what are the, some of those common mistakes that people make? Yeah, I mean, the biggest mistake that we see, Nick, is that people aren't prepared. I mean, that's really kind of the biggest mistake because because they've got the clock and like the clock starts ticking and everybody starts, you know, rushing around and you've got to make sure that you can, you know, satisfy your exchange. And, you know, again, I don't have to tell you people in the real estate world, you know, you're out there making offers on properties. You're one of 10, 12, 17, 15 offers on one property. It's tough to get. Believe it or not, we don't have a lot of failed transactions. People end up finding something, whether they might pay a little bit more for it and maybe, or maybe it's not the right deal investment. They'd much rather buy now as opposed to paying Uncle Sam the tax due on the property because that that's a, a significant amount. And that basically eats into their equity. So again, if you sell a property that's got four or five, six hundred thousand dollars of gain in it and don't complete an exchange, you're looking at a fairly hefty tax bill. And it's always better to find something and buy it as opposed to paying the, the capital gains tax on it. So I think yeah. preparation is really the biggest um, the biggest factor that people should account for when they take an exchange. And, you know, we try to impress upon, especially the real estate community is get started up front, right? If you know you're taking a mm -hmm. listing on a on an investment property, the light bulb goes off, aha, this client is eligible for 1031 treatment. Let me start planting the seed with them to make sure to see if they're even looking at doing an exchange because if they are, then I can start helping them find the replacement property because that's going to be their big challenge. Yes, especially in this market, you know, uh, for sure. 2021, probably not going to change anytime, at least for the foreseeable first few months of 2022, the real estate market is still going to be pretty similar in terms of kind of prepping for it. So you're what's called the 1031 exchange accommodator. Yeah, uh, so qualified intermediary is kind of the more up to date mm -hmm. term. Yeah, but okay. yes, we're the accommodator, the facilitator. QI or qualified intermediary is kind of the term we, we prefer. The qualified intermediary. Got it. Yeah. And so what is your role in, in getting things set up and how does that work? Yeah. So we basically will generally interface with the escrow agent, the closing agent, whoever is going to handle the closing of the relinquished property. We'll work with them to set up the exchange. We'll provide them instructions and documentation. We'll provide similar documentation to the client, the exchange or person entering into the 1031. And then we uh, receive the funds. When the escrow closes, we provide um, what we call a safe harbor for the exchange dollars. So the exchange funds are held by First American and we help the client kind of monitor their key deadlines, right? The 45 day and the 180 day mm -hmm. deadline for the exchange. So our role is kind of sandwiched in between the sale escrow and ultimately their purchase escrow as well. Got it. So you guys, so once the sale, uh, coming back to the sale in San Clemente buying Mission Viejo example, um, once that piece of real estate in San Clemente sells, uh, escrow closes, the funds then go from escrow directly to First American. And then once they identify that property in Mission Viejo, they go from you guys straight to that escrow company. So it never hits their account. That's right. And that's one of the key components of an exchange. And we refer to that term as constructive receipt. So the client for 
reasons that are dictated by the tax code, they can't have any re constructive receipt of their funds. So we provide that, again, safe harbor of the exchange dollars. Got it. I'm curious, would somebody be able to pull out a portion of those funds? Say they have $500,000 that goes over to First American. Would they, could they say, hey, Anthony, I, you know what? I want to use 400,000 uh, for this exchange and I want 100,000 to go somewhere else. Maybe they want to diversify yep. their portfolio. Maybe they just sure. want cash in hand. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I always refer to that as kind of a partial exchange, but definitely allowable for sure. And the amount that they exclude is referred to as boot. So boot is the taxable component of an exchange. And I just, you know, we, we, we don't provide tax or legal guidance to clients, but we would tell them, look, if you're doing an exchange and you're selling something for 500,000 and you're only including 400 in your exchange, that hundred thousand dollars is potentially taxable and you'll pay tax on that amount. Got it. So if they were to buy equal in equity, but lower in price, how would that impact things? Yeah, generally when you have that, you generally have a, a trade down, right? So let's say they sold something for a million and they paid off their debt and they were left now with $800,000 of equity. Mm -hmm. So they just bought something for cash of 800,000. They're going to have a $200,000 delta between what they sold and what they purchased. That amount represents basically the debt relief that they had. So they end up paying tax on the $200,000. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah, yeah, always better to go equal or greater than. <laughs> Always better to do that. Yeah. I mean, again, and you know, capital yeah. gains tax do vary for individuals. A lot of it's based on their income structure. So I give people a range again, because I don't, I don't want to give them a specific, but you know, it can be 30 to even 35 plus percent. If everyone meets, if they meet the maximum thresholds on all of the capital gain opportunities, you've got state, you've got federal, you've got the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act tax, if that's still in play. And then you also have the depreciation component known as recapture. So you do have really four opportunities or to pay tax on. And if you're meeting all those income requirements and thresholds, then you're over 35% for capital gains tax. So it can be a significant okay. number. Yeah, uh, definitely sounds like it. You just noted something that I think a lot of people aren't too familiar with. I've talked to a lot of homeowners and they say, oh, I'm going to depreciate my assets as much as I can and just depreciate, depreciate, depreciate. Uh, how does, if somebody really just pushes that depreciation number on their piece of real estate, how does that impact things when they go to do an exchange? Well, as long as they exchange for equal value to what they're selling, the deferral, if you will, the depreciation will continue on on their new property as well too. Where people run into trouble is just like if they trade down, right? If they trade down in value, then the recapture can't be deferred into the new property, just like it was, just like the capital gains tax. So again, we have many people that have owned property real estate here for 30 plus years and it's fully depreciated. So for them, again, it's imperative that they really buy up or really actually they buy, yeah, they buy up in value to what they're selling. Otherwise they're gonna get stuck with, you know, again, another sizable tax bill or depreciation bill when they file their tax return. Yeah, got it. Um, and then here's something I get all the time, uh, especially with somebody who's typically a first time home buyer. They say, Nick, I wanna buy a property, maybe up in Long Beach, Irvine, Lake Forest, wherever it is. And they say, I'm planning to live in it. And then I want to do a 1031 exchange to the next property. And I tell them, hold on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's what's kind of the um, the rule around that? And how long does somebody need to not live in the property? Or can they live in it a portion of the time they own it? We definitely see that a lot. Yeah, we see a lot of people here, especially in Orange County, um, Southern California, where they have bought their first home five, six, ten years ago and they have outgrown it or they want to you know they, they have an opportunity to buy something else and they now have converted their primary residence into their investment property i mean here's the tough part nick with some of these questions i mean there's not a lot of guidance on that and i think it's specifically so that there's not a set number of months or years associated to conversion um you know from your primary residence to investment property but if someone bought a property in 2010 and they lived there for five years and in 2015, they made it their investment property. And now it's 2021 and they want to do a 1031 exchange. No problem, right? Mm -hmm. Totally fine. Yeah. If they bought it in 2010, they moved out of it in August of 2021 and they rent it out for September, October, and November. And now they want to do a 1031. I think they probably have a problem. So again, you've, you've got to, you know, work with your tax yeah. advisor, work with your CPA, you know, find out what a good comfortable number is in terms of reporting. You know, a lot of CPAs, love two years, right? That's just a feel good that makes everybody happy. I've held it for two years. It's been a rental for me. 
I'm going to now 1031 out into something else. Great, no problem. You know, that should be fine. But you know, when we look at 1031 transactions, it boils down usually to a single word, and that's intent. What is their intent? And the intent for an exchange property has to be what we kind of discussed earlier, property held for investment, or it's also property used for in a trade or business. So we're not just talking about residential transactions as well. We're talking about properties that are used in productive use in a trader business, commercial, industrial, um, warehouses, things like that. Those all can be 1031 as well. But for the personal residence, the bigger question is how does someone take their existing 1031 property that they bought last year and they want to now move into there and, and call that their primary residence? That's more of what we see where people are planning for retirement. They maybe are they, they're going to move. They want to get out of California at some point in the future. So they sell their San Clemente property today, they buy their replacement property in Idaho or Tennessee or South Carolina or Florida with the understanding that 10 years from now they're going to retire and they're eventually going to want to move into there. And that's also something yeah. that's, you know, allowed as well too. Uh, and I, people ask, well, how long, you know, everyone wants, they want that, that key date. How many, <laughs> how many days do I have to stay here? How many weeks? Yeah. How many months? Um, you know, I just tell them the longer the better, right? There is a requirement that says, if you're going to convert that property and ultimately take your exemption, which is your personal residence exemption, which is the 250 if you're single, 500 if you're married, you have to hold that property for at least five years before you can take the exemption. So in my mind, logic would say they, the minimum should be hold it for investment for three, then move into mm -hmm. it. There's years four and five, and now you've satisfied that requirement. You've held it for five years and you've occupied it for any two of the last five years. So you can, at that point, then presumably sell it, take your personal residence exclusion. If you have capital gain over and above that, then you'd be probably going to be subject to that capital gains tax. But people do, you know, m m more people are not trying to move out of it. They're just trying to plan for their future and have something available to them to move into once they retire here or, you know, move out of California kind of thing. Yeah. So there are some different strategies. We, we try to take a backseat to, you know, counseling them on that. Um, we want to make sure that they're definitely interfacing with their tax, you know, professional, their CPA to make sure that they guide them correctly because, you know, we're really here to process the exchange for them and try to not provide a lot of tax guidance for them, if any at all. Got it. So it sounds like the second key component to this is just getting good tax advice as well. Absolutely. And, and brain, brainstorm with a, with a good CPA. You're exactly right. And, and that's something that really gets sometimes lost in, in this transaction. And and we really try to make sure that people have a good sound tax advisor, especially when, you know, we're talking about significant numbers and many of my clients have significant holdings of, of real estate. They really need to, you know, have that as a key member of their team as well too, a consultant that can help them with the tax strategies for sure. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious, totally random question here. Uh, what's the smallest exchange you've done and what's the biggest ex exchange you've been a part of? Oh gosh, the smallest, probably 25,000. Yeah, someone had a, wanted to do an exchange for 25,000 bucks on a property, you know, it was out of state somewhere, but uh, yeah. it, it was very small. And I even, I, I don't say encourage them, but I really pressed them on why they wanted to do an exchange, but they had they had 100% gain, right? They had bought the property for next to nothing. They'd taken as much appreciation as they could. They just want, and they, and really the key for them was they had a replacement property already ready to go. So why pay the tax if you don't have to defer yeah. the gain into the new property? You know, we charge them a very minimal fee for that and they were successful with their exchange. The largest deal, probably a billion and a half and some change. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm assuming commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't was, any, was, I don't know any residences that would uh, trade for a billion and a half. <laughs> yeah, no, the spectrum for 1031 is is vast, right? So, I mean, again, as I said, property held for productive use in a trade or business or held for investment, that encompasses really everything, right? The only thing that it excludes would be your primary residence. Mm -hmm. That's outside of the guide, uh, the scope of 1031. What I would call a true vacation home or second home. So if the, if the client only uses their condo on Maui for their own personal use, that's not going to be a 1031 exchange. And then property that's held for sale is also excluded from 1031. And I, an easy definition of property held for sale is where investors are flipping property. Got it. They buy something with no intent to hold it. They're going to fix it up, put it back on the market for a quick buck. Yeah. 
So but you can't again, can't do a ten thirty one exchange as a as a flipper, more or less. Really, you shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's because you don't meet the smell test for held for investment. Yeah, you really yeah. you have intent you're, you're, to sell the property in the very near future. Yeah, Got but it. but everything else, like I said, fair game. You know, again, residential, uh, multifamily, um, commercial, industrial, office, warehouse. I mean. Well, raw land qualifies for 1031 treatment. So mm -hmm. as long as it fits in that, you know, health for investment category, you're generally good to go. Got it. So do people ever come up to you and say, Hey, Anthony, I've got three different properties. I'd like to sell them all and do a 1031 exchange with all three and invest that capital into one larger property, maybe a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, or whatever that may be. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the two best strategies for a 1031, Nick, are consolidation and diversification. So again, taking your consolidation method, taking the three small little rental properties and maybe going and buying a, a fourplex or a, a little small apartment building or even like a office building, right, where they've got a single tenant. Totally fine. Diversification, just the opposite, taking your one large property and moving your money around to different property types, maybe in different states where you get a better value for your dollar. So. Those are all perfect strategies for 1031. Of course, the kicker is the timing, right? With yeah. consolidation, you got to get all three sold first and get the one that you're trying to purchase tied up in time. And with diversification, once your relinquished property sells, you got 45 days to identify the replacement properties. You got to get them all closed within 180 days. So timing is always the key for those strategies. Yeah, that diversification sounds like it'd be hard to do with the 1031. That sounds like a very quick turnaround time because you're buying multiple properties. Yeah, honestly, so with a solid agent, you know, listing strategy and putting say three or four homes up on the on the exact same weekend, that should be pretty doable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the diversification works easily enough if they prep it, right? And they they get their replacement properties identified before they close the relinquished property. I mean, you know, the same same strategy really Nick is remember I always tell people as the seller generally you have control over when you close your transaction. So if you know you're going to do an exchange, you can always build in an extension if you need it, right? A buyer coming in and buy your property has mm -hmm. got to be flexible, especially if they know up front, hey, look, we'll give you the 30 day escrow, but we also want to build in one 30 day or even two 30 day extensions if we need it, because we need to satisfy our exchange. Not unreasonable. Yeah, definitely not in this market. No, no. In a, uh, in a buyer's market, that'd be a little more difficult to do. But even if somebody wants a property and they're getting a good deal for it, I, I don't I don't know why anybody would I, avoid I that. totally agree. I totally agree. So, yeah. you know, it's always worth the ask, you know, ask it and, and see what what happens. The worst they can say is now, or where you look to another offer. But, you know, the sellers usually know what they want to do going into it. It's just a matter of finding the right property. That's Got the it. biggest key. Yeah. So what are you seeing most investors targeting as the purpose of an exchange? Is it cash flow appreciation? Is it what what kind of main things are you seeing? Yeah, that I wish I could give you a better answer. I don't have one for you because a lot of times investors don't really share what their strategy is. I think for them, you know, it depends on where they're going, Nick. You know, I mean, if they're buying something here in California, cash flow is probably not their priority. Mm -hmm. If they're buying something out of state, they're probably chasing better investment and they're looking for more cash flow for sure. California is more about appreciation, especially in Southern California. So yeah. if they're breaking even, they're probably okay. They just know that that house they bought in Mission Viejo or Newport Beach or Corona Mar is probably gonna go up in value over the next three to five years. And they're okay with that. Yeah, got it. All right, uh, is there anything I'm missing? I mean, I, you know, I think we've touched on two, two key areas that I always talk about when I do my presentation, setting it up, prepping for it and having competent, you know, counsel at your disposal because, you know, me as the QI, you as a real estate agent or broker, I mean, you're limited on what you want to give them. You want to stick to what you know, your yep. specialty, which is helping them find the replacement property and get the relinquished property sold. I want to stick to my specialty, which is, you know, setting up the exchange and preparing the documents, making sure everything's compliant with, you know, the state and federal regs for 1031. But they have yeah. questions about tax, legal, what have you. They need to have a consultant on their team. And we really stress that to our clients to have that available to them and everyone goes well you know i don't really have a cpa i don't really do i do my own re reporting i strongly encourage them to find somebody in the marketplace that can help them do that um, and i know i've turned to jimmy actually a few times and asked yep. him for a local reference uh for someone that they can refer people to so i think those are the big strategies but you know understanding the process is fairly easy 
right? You got 45 days to identify, you got 180 days to close. I mean, that's really what you need to be focused on for your exchange. Yeah. So, so my biggest two takeaways from this conversation are you've got that 45 day window and yeah, get a solid team behind you. And we're super fortunate to have, I mean, I, I was just on an hour long Zoom call with my CPA yesterday talking about all kinds of strategies and buying investment properties and all that. And yeah, I ping him all the time about stuff. My yeah. clients ask me, hey, what what's uh, what are the implications here and there? And they talk about depreciation and, and all that. And I go, honestly, I know a little bit about it, but you got to go talk to this guy. He's yeah, that's amazing. exactly right. Yep. Yeah. I do the same thing, Nick. I do the same thing because I get these calls all the time where someone, well, my CPA said to call the, the QI. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you go back to your CPA and say, this is a, t I can, I can answer questions all day long at 1031. Happy to, happy to answer because there's a, a, you know, a host of questions that are related to the exchange, but more times than not, people need specific direction on their specific tax picture. Yep, exactly. On their specific economy because they, yeah. Depends on how they're getting paid, if they're 1099, if they're taking draws from an S-Corp or whatever's going on there. They've got losses, they're all they've, got, have all gains, kinds they've of, got all these things. Yeah. yeah, for sure. We have no idea what's going on behind the scenes there. Exactly. That's why they're licensed and take a lot of exams and uh, they're the right. pros. Right. <laughs> I agree. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time, Anthony. I really appreciate it. Great. Always happy to help. Hey, thanks again for listening to the Real Estate Roundtable. If you'd like to connect with any of the sales partners here on the REIT team, our information is below and we'd love to chat with you.